everybody. I'm here to work with you today. I know that we're not together like we usually are, but because of COVID-19, this is the safest way for us to work together. So do you remember last time we talked about how organisms are related in ecosystems? We have the producers at the, at the bottom of the trophic levels, and they produce energy for every other level in the ecosystem where they are. So we have plants like grass and trees and flowering plants like black-eyed Susans. They all are eaten by primary consumers like rabbits and grasshoppers. And you all named a lot of other organisms that eat plants. And then those organisms, rabbits and gazelles and grasshoppers, are eaten by secondary consumers like snakes and skunks and uh, chickens and wolves and tigers. And then we have tertiary consumers and those organisms eat other organisms that eat plants. So these are the trophic levels that we can find in ecosystems in here in Kansas and many other places. And remember that the decomposers are organisms that break down the waste and the bodies of all the organisms at every other, at every level in the um, trophic level, at every trophic level, and bring them back, all those nutrients back to the soil so that the, the plants have the nutrients that they need to grow. So energy flows from plants up through all the different trophic levels and then the decomposers break those nutrients down so that they can, so that the cycle can continue. So this is what we talked about last time. And this time, we're gonna be talking about soil. And all the trophic levels that you see here above ground actually happen below ground too. And so I'm just gonna show you a few organisms that live below ground, but they're tiny. That's why we can't really see them very well. Um, I couldn't bring you microscopes to, to see these organisms because they're too tiny. So I'm gonna show you some images and some videos of them so that you get, can get a sense of what they look like. They do all the things that these organisms do, but just they're just generally pretty small. So what you're looking at here is a nematode that's been isolated from soil. And this would be a primary consumer. A lot of nematodes eat the roots of plants and can be real, um, real um, problems for many crop plants. So what we're seeing here is worms that are placed in between two glass plates with leaves on the top. And what you can see is the, the tunnels that the worms are digging. And they're breaking down the leaves and, and bringing them into the soil. So this is a time-lapse um, video. And it is actually is a whole month worth of worms breaking down the leaves on the surface and bringing them into the soil. So you can see at the leaves are slowly, slowly um, being absorbed, and there's fewer and fewer leaves. Um, and then pretty soon, there'll be hardly any. And you can see how the tunnels are increasing below ground. Now, there are other organisms in the soil. Remember we talked about fungi as being decomposers? Well, there's another group, other groups of fungi, and one group that has been um, associ that associates with many different plant species are all of these different species of what are called mycorrhizal fungi, and these fungi make their living in a different way than decomposing um, leaf litter and um, waste and bodies of organisms. They associate with the roots of plants and they pull in nutrients for them. So they send out little string-like hyphae all through the soil and then they pull in the nutrients that they, 
that they can access, that they can get and bring it back to the host plant. And the host plant gives the fungi sugar so that they can continue to grow. So it's a, a beneficial rela relationship called a mutualism. So all of these spores are, are a part of mycorrhizal fungi. They're just one part. Now I'm going to show you the difference between a mycorrhizal plant and a non-mycorrhizal plant. So here you're seeing soybeans that are commonly grown here in Kansas. And these plants aren't inoculated. There's no mycorrhizal fungi associated with their roots. And this plant is associated with mycorrhizal fungi. And you can see that this plant is much smaller than this plant. So the fungi, the mycorrhizal fungi, benefit the plants that they associate with. And then there are organisms that eat the decomposers and eat the plants themselves. So this is a mole. Um, you don't get to see them very much because they live below ground and they eat a lot of different kinds of insects and worms. Um, and they're bigger than most things that live underground, but this is, this is a mole and it is a mammal and it is eating a juicy worm. So today, we're going to focus on soil. We're not going to focus on what lives in soil. We're going to focus on just the non-living part of soil. So my first question for you today is, <clears throat> are there rocks in soil? So I want you to think about that. And then let's go, let's go see. If you were with me today, what I'd have you do is put on your safety glasses first, like so. And then we take these rocks that I found in my yard, and I would say, okay, now you, I want you to bang one of these rocks, this rock, into this rock. And I'm gonna have you bang it for 30 seconds, and let's see what happens. And I'd say, make sure that you don't get your fingers in between the rocks, because that would hurt. So here we go. You ready? Oops. <laughs> so what what we've done is we've we've broken we've broken rock. And what I hope you can see is that there's lots of little pieces of rock that have been, that broke off when we bang the rocks together. And if you look closely, you can see some of the pieces of rock are really small and other pieces of the rock are much larger. And these are components of soil. So, there's different sized pieces of rocks in soil, and we're going to investigate that a little bit further. We're going to move to the table now. So what we've done by breaking up these rocks is we've eroded them. And erosion, where rocks are broken up, that usually hap happens over long periods of time. And there's different ways that rocks are eroded. So I have this diagram here. So sometimes rocks are eroded because water gets in the cracks and when water, water freezes, if it gets cold, it expands and so it makes those cracks bigger. And so over time, the rocks develop more and more cracks and break up and smaller and smaller pieces might be blown away from the freezing and thawing of the rock. Plants can also erode rock. Here in this picture, you can see roots growing into a rock. And as those roots go down and find the little cracks, they grow into the rock. And then as the roots expand, as they grow, as they get bigger, they pull the rock apart. And that's another way that rocks can be eroded.
Water can erode rocks, rocks that are near oceans or lakes where the water rushes in and out with the wind or with the tide. And so you can see these rocks have eroded in different places. A wind that has small pieces of rock can erode um, larger pieces of rock. So if you see here, this is a desert system. This is rock in a desert. And when the wind blows with tiny particles of, of soil or sand in it, it can cause the rock to erode. So all of these ways are ways that rocks move from a solid rock to parts of soil. They usually happen over long periods of time, but we just, we can make it happen over short periods of time. Do you think that soil can become rock? Well, it can. That kind of rock is called sedimentary rock. And it's called sedimentary rock because it's formed from sediments, like small pieces of soil. So I can show you sedimentary rock where organisms long, long, long time ago were on the surfaces of these rocks and then were pressed, I'm sorry, the organisms were on the surface of soil and they got pressed, pressed hard into that soil. And so what's left is rock that has the impression of these organisms in it. Now, it turns out that 87 million years ago, Kansas was actually on the bottom of an inland sea. And I have a picture of that here. So Kansas wasn't land. It was under a very big sea, just like a lot of the plain states of the United States. So here is the United States, or what, became, what will become the United States. And here is that inland sea. And Kansas, I'm trying to find where Kansas is, Kansas is right here. And so a lot of the organisms that we see in sedimentary rock are marine fossils. So they're the impressions of marine organisms that lived 85 87 to 85 million years ago. And I have some right here. So I think that you can make out the shells in this rock. There's a lot of shells in this piece of rock that I found really close to where I live. And then there's other rocks all around me where I can find small bits of organisms that lived in the bottom of this inland sea. That's a crinoid. So crinoids are related to starfish. And I'm going to show you a picture in a little bit of what a crinoid looked like. This is just the stalk of it. And these are fossils of trilobites, which are related to the crustaceans that we see here today. Isopods, for example, those little roly polies that we saw last time, they're related to these trilobites that are extinct now. And then here, we can see the impression of leaves from millions of years ago in this rock. So soil scientists try to understand the kind of soil that they 
are working with um, in a lot of different ways. And so one of the ways is to see how the different parts of soil separate um, based on size. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our pieces of rock that we've broken up and we are going to put them in this sieve, this set of six. So let me show you what they look like. So there's the biggest size and so you can see that they've got little holes in them. And this is about um, 1.4 millimeters each, the, each space. And this space is even smaller. This is just, um, this is about, this is about half of that, 500, uh, 0.5 millimeters. And then this is the pan that we're gonna catch everything that's, everything that's left over in it. So we're going to put these together. adding a little more sand so that we can see what happens when we separate the different particles by size. So what you can see is the largest particles of rock are trapped on the largest sieve size. And then the smaller pieces come through. But then there's even smaller pieces um, that aren't trapped on the second sieve that come through into the pan. And I wish you could be here so that you could feel the difference between the textures. So this feels really rough in the top pan. This one feels less rough, but then this one feels so smooth and soft. So what we know is that there's very large pieces of rock in soil, and then there's smaller pieces of rock that are sand that can be large pieces and then very small pieces. And then there's silt, which is even smaller, and clay, which is the smallest. And so I have clay right here. And you've probably played with clay before. And it looks like it's one piece, but actually the pieces are stuck together and I'm going to show you how we can get them to separate. So now we're just going to add a little bit of water. I wish you could be here to do this with me. It would be a lot more fun. Now I'm just going to mix up. I'm just, what I'm doing is I'm pushing on the clay and the tiny particles of clay are being suspended in the water. So there's still that lump of clay there, but it's getting smaller as the tiny particles are separated and suspended in water. So we know that there's different sized particles of rock in soil. But there's something else in soil besides the living organisms that we've talked about, like the roots of plants and insects and worms. There's this dead material. And you can see 
that these are leaves. But over the winter and the spring, a lot of time, a lot of organisms and wind and whatever break these leaves up. Part of the decomposition process is breaking the leaves up into smaller and smaller pieces until they're so small that you can't necessarily tell what they were. So if you were walking on a forest floor right now, if you went out for a hike, you might see pieces of leaf that look like this and you can tell, you could tell that they were leaves. But then you might see pieces of broken leaves that maybe you could still tell were leaves, but then they get smaller and smaller as you look underneath the larger pieces of leaf and it would be hard to tell what they were, where they came from. Soil scientists can understand properties of soil based on their size, but they can also learn about soil based on the density of the particles of that soil. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at these different um, components of soil. We have different sized pieces of rock. We have leaves that are incorporated into soil. We have clay and smaller particles that are incorporated into soil. So we're going to see what happens when we put them in a column of water. Um, so this is um, a gradient, and we're going to count how many seconds it takes for these different particles to move through the water. But before we do that, let's hypothesize what's going to happen. Let's make a prediction. I'm going to have you make a prediction, and you can think about it as, we're, as I'm doing it here. So do you think that these larger particles of sand will fall fastest or slowest? What about these medium-sized particles of sand? And how about these smallest particles of sand, do you think, and, and even smaller particles, do you think that they'll fall slowly or quickly through the, the water? And then what do you think will happen with this clay that's suspended in water? Do you think that that will fall quickly or slowly? And then finally, what about these pieces of, of leaves? Another term for them is organic matter. It's just um, a catch-all term for anything that was living that's now dead. So we call it organic matter, or O-M. But what we can see is these are pieces of leaves and pieces of roots and sticks in this small petri dish. So what do you think will happen? What do you hypothesize? Okay, let's find out. So as I do this, I want you to count how many seconds it takes for these largest particles to fall through the water column. And remember, when we're counting, we can count by saying, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. That's about a second, each of those. Or you could say one 1,000, two 1,000. But when you get to 10, after you say 10 Mississippi or 10 1,000, then you just say 11, 12, 13, if we get that far. OK? So let's start. Are we ready? All right, so I'm not going to count. You're going to count. So how many seconds did you count? So I was counting until the smallest piece fell to the bottom, and I counted three Mississippis. Is that what you counted? Well, I'm going to write three on the board, but if you counted something different, you can write that on a sheet of paper in front of you. 
So now let's try the next size, smallest. So this is our medium sand. Okay, here we go. How many seconds did you get for the medium size uh, particles of sand? I got four, but again, you write what you counted because you're a scientist too. Let's try our smallest particles of sand. And then there's particles in here that are even smaller. Let's see how long it takes them to fall through this water column. How many seconds did you count? I counted 13. I was, it's a little bit harder when the particles get really small to see when, the, when most of them or all of them are at the very bottom. I counted 13. Okay. Are we ready for the clay. Okay, here we go. Are you still counting? You could count for a really long time, hours, perhaps even a day, before that clay will fall to the bottom with the other particles that are there. So the last part of soil that we're going to see what happens when we put in this water column are the leaves. So we're going to take a pinch and put those in and see what happens. What do you predict will happen? So the clay will take a long time to fall. More than 30, more than 60 seconds for sure. And the leaves are floating. So the organic matter just, and the leaves, they're the, really the same thing. We're gonna put those in too. The, uh, and you can see that they float. So the leaves and organic matter, they float. So, so far, we know that soil is rocks, of different sizes, it is, also has organic matter in it or what we put in it was leaves. Let's see if there's anything else. So there's something else in soil that we can't see. And I want to show you that. So I have containers here of sandy soil and more complex soil. So the complex soil has lots of different particle sizes. Um, small and big and some organic matter and the sand is just got sort of larger particles of rock. So I'm going to pour this water into these little beakers that have either sand or soil 
and you have to watch really closely to see what happens, okay? And I want you to, to look at really closely what you're seeing, okay? So I'm gonna start with the sand. Do you see that? What is that? Now we're gonna try the same thing with, with the soil. So I'm going to put water really quickly. I'm gonna pour it on top of the soil and let's see what happens. So what did you see? What do you, what do you think that was that you were seeing? Did you see bubbles? Right, you saw bubbles. What is in bubbles? What is in bubbles? Air. So there's air in soil, and it's really important for plants and the other organisms in soil for there to be air in it. Without air, the plant's roots can't grow very well unless they have very special adaptations. And many insects couldn't grow, couldn't survive in the soil. Worms can't survive in soil that doesn't have air in it. That's why when it rains, they have to come to the surface to get to get air. So air is important and that's another important component of soil. So soils have different amounts, depending on where you are, of sand or clay or larger particles of sand, or smaller particles of sand, or silt. So all over the world, we can identify the texture of soils based on how much organic matter, sand, silt, and clay are in the soils that we're looking at. So our last activity is something called water races. So what we're going to do is we're going to see how quickly water will move through columns of clay. So there are some soils that are mostly clay. Organic matter, so leaves and other dead bits of plant material. Sand, sandy soil. And then complex soil. So they're all, we have columns of, of all of these um, clay, organic matter, sand, and complex soil. They're all about the same height in each of these tubes. And we're going to put fifth, 10 mils of water. We're going to put 10 mils of water in this graduated cylinder. And it's important when you're measuring using a graduated cylinder that the top of the water layer, the surface, is going to have a little curve in it. And you want to measure to the base of that curve. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with our clay. And we're going to do just what we did before. We're going to count how many seconds it takes for the water to flow through and out the tube. You ready? So we're waiting for this water to go all the way through so we don't see any more water at the top of the surface of the clay. And we could stand here and count for a long, long time, but it'll probably take longer than we want to count. So I'm going to put this down 
in the pan. And we can look at this um, later after we've done the others. So we're just going to write in for our clay, we're going to write more than 30 seconds. Now we're going to do the organic matter. Are you ready? Okay, you're going to have to watch. So how many seconds did you count? I counted eight seconds. So if you want to make a data sheet like this, you can. I'm just going to write eight seconds. Now we're going to try the sandy soil, see what happens. That was really fast. I counted three seconds. But we're going to do that again because it happened so quickly. You ready? <laughs> that was about three seconds again. This is the complex soil. Let's see how many seconds it takes to move through this column. like it's in. How many seconds did you get? I got about 15. So you'll notice not much water came out of the bottom of the complex soil and that's because the there's a lot of surface area that the water is bound to. So even though it moves through the column not as much comes out the bottom as with the organic matter or the sandy soil. Okay, you ready? I think it's all the way through. How many seconds did you count? I counted 18. So, if you were a plant or an insect, that depended on 
water being in the soil, because that's something else that we now know is in soil, water. Would it be easier for you to grow in sandy soil or complex soil? So sometimes people think, well, the water's moving quickly through the sandy soil, so it's probably better for the plants. But if you think about a plant like you are with a straw and you're trying to get a drink, if the water's flowing too fast, and you need to suck up that water as it's moving through sandy soil, will you be able to get a drink as well as if it were moving through complex soil? No, not really, because the water is going too quickly. So if you were a plant, you'd have more time to collect the water, to bring the water in from the soil into your roots, if you were living and growing in complex soil. So we're done with our experiments for the day, but I am going to set up a small experiment where I have radish seeds growing in sandy soil and complex soil. And I'd like you to make a prediction about which plants will grow better, the ones in complex soil or the ones in sandy soil. And then we'll take a look in a couple weeks and see what we see.